excuse me. Okay, so all that stuff you did yesterday would have sucked even more if um, we didn't have the opportunity to do automated data analysis in terms of getting rid of that whole gaining step. Because a lot of this stuff yesterday was just reading in the files, doing transformation, conversation. That was like um, getting the first phase. Um, we're going to get a little bit, oh, Camtasia. Did we do the Camtasia thing? We did. I was trying. All right. Um, so here's where we get go for the home run. So in um, this section, I'm going to talk about the state of the art in terms of how to get rid of that problem of manual gating. Um, talking about the FlowCap project, which is a lot of effort uh, in trying to evaluate different methods. I'm going to talk about two tools that we're talking and using a lot more about today, Archaeoptimix and Flow Density. Um, Archaeoptimix, uh, I think, is a fantastic tool for doing discovery, uh, finding all the populations, and telling which one is the most important, and Flow Density is a package for doing diagnosis where you know what you want to find but you don't want to have to find it by hand. So yesterday we kind of walked through and got you up until data transformation, I think. So now we're at the next step of looking at what we can do to identify populations. And then once you have those populations, there's a couple different tools you can get to diagnose and discovery. So since about, well, there's a couple of people who kind of messed around doing automated gating. Um, in, in the early days, like Bob Murphy, um, they kind of sucked. Uh, they were uh, toy examples, and nobody really used them. The methods of the people. Oh no, the, the Bob Murphy's awesome, uh, <laughs> but he he just used basically like a k-means approach, and it worked kind of, but nobody was using it, um, mostly because it didn't doesn't really work. It's not really just generalizable. It's not robust. That all changed starting about 2008. There was a bit of a renaissance. And since then, um, 14 different R packages have been released that just do manual gating. There's about 20 packages in all. Some stuff that's not in R, but we're just going to put this in our workshop. Um, but there's some other stuff um, that's sort of one off kind of approaches. Um, there's like in Python um, and, so, and Java, stuff like that. But by far and large, 14 out of the different 20 packages that have been published have been in R. So it kind of shows you the power of R for doing what you want to do. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of hope in the future there's going to be a lot more stuff in R as a result. And basically because, like you've seen today, it leverages that whole infrastructure. So if you're developing a clustering method, you don't have, and you want people to use that, you don't have to write all the extra code that does everything else that you guys are working on up till now to get people to use the code. And that, that's a lot of, that's a, seriously a lot of effort to do all that stuff just to get an FCS file into a program and to manipulate that. And, and the people doing the clustering algorithms don't want to have to write all that stuff again so they can you know tap into the stuff that we have. And it's you know it's physical programming language, so it leverages all the tools that are in there. It, it just kind of makes sense. So there's two different analysis problems, and they really need different ways to salute, um, to approach that mathematically. So if you're trying to do discovery, you you really know what you're trying to find. So you've designed some marker panel to look at pr pretty much the areas that you think are important. Um, you, you, you want to find NK cells, you have some markers in there to find those NK cells. Um, but there's going to be other stuff you just might throw in there because um, you're doing a fishing expedition. Um, you, you were curious about what else it could be, so you throw some other stuff in, you might, might find something into this other stuff. And then the goal is you want to find every cell population in every sample because you don't know which one is going to be the one that's going to be interesting to you. You, you got some ideas based on biology, well, what could be important, it's, you know, T cell, the B cell. Um, but, you know, it, it could be this one, it could be that one, we're not really sure. And then for every population, you want to see, um, does this cell population that we're looking at this time correlate with my outcome of interest? Do, am I getting a p-value less than 0.05? If you find something that's important, then you publish and you win. You're done. If, if the one you're looking at is not the one that's important, then you go look at the next one, and you got a little for each loop going here in biology. It's like we have for each loops going on in code. You keep going around, looking at a population, looking at a population, next population. Oh, I got one. And then you stop, right? You don't look for, you found one, and tend to say, that's good enough for me. You might keep looking, but generally that doesn't seem to be the case. Diagnosis is a bit different approach. You know what you're looking for, so you can design a marker panel to find just that population. And then the question is, um, for this population that I know is important, because that's the one I'm looking for, is is the MM5 or is the proportion over some threshold 
that it's my criteria to make that diagnosis. If yes, then the person's sick and is going to die. If no, then that person's going to be healthy. Or if yes, these mice are going to do something. And if no, these mice are going to do something else. So the way we approach these are, are different. And which of these tools to use is a a difficult problem. Not that my group would do this, but other groups, when they publish it, they only show their best data, right? Um, here's, my, here's my algorithm. Look, it found the stuff they were looking for. It's fantastic. And uh, every paper that's published does this on a different set of data. Now, here's, here's my algorithm. Look, it works on my data. Here's my algorithm. Look, it works on my data. And what people ha haven't done is, look, here's my algorithm. Oh, look, here's another algorithm. And mine works better than that one on this data set. That tended not to really happen. And because of that, it was difficult to assess the relative merits of one algorithm versus the other. Um, everyone is showing on their own data sets, or the data sets they had were um, toy examples, weren't very complicated analysis. So a bunch of us got together three times now. Um, basically, everybody in the world, it's, there's not that many of us, um, they were developing automated algorithms. And if that building had fallen over, we'd have set the field back 20 years, because that's, that's, that's everybody, seriously. Um, who were developing these automated tools in a really collaborative manner in open and trying to, it's not so much a competition because we didn't want it there to be losers um, because then people aren't happy and I'm Canadian and we want everybody to be happy. Um, <laughs> but to sit, really see um, where one method works better than the others because these methods were developed to do different kind of things and it's important to know when one, our hope was to see, well this method works really good for that, this method works really good for that. Um, this one, okay, kind of sucks, but you know, it's maybe it complements to something like this. Uh, so all the results, all the code, all the methods, and how we did all the analysis, they're all available at fullcap.flowsite.org. It was a really open approach. Um, everyone was uh, sharing. Uh, we published a pa the public paper came out um, earlier this year in Nature Methods. Um, Nemo's a grad student in my lab who did that. The, um, this is a summary of the results from the first uh, FlowCap project, and one of the main take-home messages from that is that these are all sort of the different kinds of methods that these different algorithms are using. They're all really approaching, or many of them are approaching the problem in different ways. Um, we tried to do the best job we could in trying to assess the relative merits. Um, an F measure is a statistical measure to say how close you are matching manual gating. I'll talk a little bit more how we did that assessment in a second, but um, not how we'll do it now. So um, one of the problems when we're trying to say how good an automated method is working is what's the gold standard that we're measuring that against? You, you, need, you need some objective measure to say this one's working and this one's not. And right now, if we struggle for this a lot, and the gold standard for Dating is somebody drawing boxes around dots. That's what people do. Um, so it's not really gold standard. It's the um, in medical practice, it's the current what's the standard of what are they, standard, yeah. standard of care, right? You have to be at least as good as that. We can't call it a gold standard um, because we know we know there's we can, but we know there's issues with that. We know if you give as we talked about yesterday, you give the same FCS file to three different people, then you get three different answers. So there's some variability. Uh, another problem that I have with that as the gold standard is because I think we can do better. I think, because that's where I'm coming from, and I'm, I'm letting you know my biases, I think computers can do a better job of finding these cell populations in high dimensional space than humans can. If that's my hypothesis, I can't prove that. I can't prove that really. Sorry? You can't prove it because it's not specific binding. I mean, the, the, the potential for yeah. Um, but the bigger problem, um, so you, you get you get point to one or two cases. You could find you could find a particular case that you say you know here some humans done something and um, actually maybe two populations. But when you look when you look at hundreds of thousands of cell populations in a big data set, um, you can't really go through all those differences one by one. It's just a really ordeal. And if if you're saying this is my best, if this is the way that humans done, any time that we find a difference from what the human has done, um, that's making us uh, be not up to that standard. And if that and it's di the difficult assessment becomes, is that difference mean we're doing it right or we're doing it wrong? And if we're saying, well, this is the way the human has done that, how, 
trying to assess, well, this difference is actually because the human did it wrong, is a really difficult process to go through and try and convince, especially when we're looking at hundreds of thousands of cell populations and all these differences. Having said that, um, if this was one, that means that um, we have done, put all the same dots into the same gates as the human had done. Um, so many of the methods are doing quite well. Um, this is how long it took those algorithms to run per sample. And so it's not, some of these methods take longer than others. Um, some are very quick. Um, and then we scored them based on all the different data sets they looked at. So, um. so but um, because we're Canadian, we want everybody to get along. Um, <laughs> And because we th it was also interesting scientific, scientific <coughs> question, we, we know that if you give two um, people the same data set, they're going to get it a bit differently. And one person might find something that the other person missed, for example. And same kind of thing happens with computer algorithms. Some algorithms were really good at finding some things, some kind because of the way they're modeling the data. They're good at finding maybe rare populations in other algorithms. Some work better at other things. And so the, the thought we had is, well, let's put these algorithms together and see if we can do a better job. And by golly, it worked. So on this figure, it's a bit complicated. Um, this is the average F measure. This is uh, the number of most consistent populations included in the sample. So we had some humans. And these are shown by these dashed lines, gate the same data. But as I said four times already, um, different humans are going to gate those populations differently. And then, so how do we measure which one's the right one? So what we said, which human is the right human? So what we did is we took all the humans, combined them together, and said, well, here's one population that all the humans agreed how to draw the box around those dots. So the, we're, we're pretty sure that they're, that one's the right one. And so that we call that population one. Everyone's putting, or at least most people, this, this one is a bit of an outlier, and it, they're all experts in the field. We can say this person's an idiot. Maybe they're not. Maybe this is the only person who knows to get it right. How do you evaluate that, right? But um, so one, two, three, four, five, six humans. One, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight humans. So all most of these eight humans all agreed on this one population because they all putting all the same dots. So the F measure against that consensus is one for those humans. And then we said, okay, well let's look at the next best population because again most of the humans except maybe one. Or, so, or maybe and that one is kind of drawing those boxes just a little bit overlapped. That's population two. So we went through all these populations that were in this data set. It was um, human products uh, stem cell data set. And uh, we did this for, we had four or five different data sets. And I'm just showing you one example here. And then we comp compared each of the algorithms against that one population that all the humans agree on. And that would be, uh, and then for all the algorithms, that's the F measure score on that one population. And we walked through all the populations. Now here, the humans are agreeing, di disagreeing more on how that one population is going to be. It's a more difficult cell population to gate. And if it's more difficult for humans, it's also more difficult for algorithms. It's tricky. We combined all the algorithms together and did something called an ensemble clustering. So that they sort of do a weighted kind of voting to say, I agree on how to gate this population. That's this line here. So if you put all these algorithms together, even though some of these algorithms suck, they're not, not doing as well, and that's, we can debate what that actually means, um, not performing as well versus the human anyway, that ensemble of all the algorithms together works better than the, um, any one algorithm and better than the best algorithm all the time. So that's kind of neat, and that kind of makes intuitive sense, that you're getting sort of a general kind of overview of how to gate this population, throw all the algorithms in, they're going to find lots of different stuff, pile them all up, and where they agree more, tends to be closer to what the humans have. So that's kind of a win. So the short answer is, uh, in terms of what algorithm should I use, you should use all of them. Um, and through the power of computers, it's not that hard because um, it's just computer time. You just throw another algorithm into the tool, you gain it again, and you go have some more, you just get longer breaks. Right? The computer's busy working, that's okay, and you can go do other stuff. Yeah. So how does this actually work? So this, this is um, one example, uh, sort of puts you in your head what, what these F measures actually look like. So um, the other, the, the uh, let's see if I get this right, manual gates. So this is the, the line is a manual gate box. So that's how the human 
drew the box around these orange dots. And the algorithms where they put that, where they put all those samples is shown in color. So these three dots, the algorithms put over here. But otherwise, it got everything more or less OK. And here's this purple sample down here. And so the humans drew the gate around here, but the algorithm said, oh, actually, this dot actually belongs to that red cell over here. So that's why this F measure isn't 1, because that one will end up in the wrong spot. Um, and 0.98, because here's a few dots that should have been over there versus the manual. Um, but this one, everybody agreed with, uh, the humans. And the green, everybody, all the algorithms, the ensemble of the algorithms agreed with the ensemble of the humans. Um, here's another example. So you can see, getting a better idea of what the F measure looks like. So again, the ensemble of the humans is looking really good, but didn't look didn't do so good for this one up here. And you can see for, for an F measure 0.86, this is what it kind of looks like. There's some stuff over here that the algorithms uh, put together with this when really maybe it shouldn't have. But um, part of the problem is, you know, this is a we're trying to look at three-dimensional data on a two-dimensional space, and sometimes it can be hard for humans to maybe get that separation right, and that's looking at it in the right way. Um, this is one case we think the humans perhaps may have been got, getting it wrong, and we, the algorithms, may have been getting it right, but that's neither here nor there. So trying to get around that whole problem of what the gold standard is, um, the idea that we had is we need something else other than manual gating to tell when gating is working well. And the way we did approach that problem was we need some measure outside of drawing boxes around dots. And one way we thought about doing that is if you have some diagnosis on some samples. You get some expert clinician um, to look at uh, some samples and say, this patient has AML. And hopefully there's, there's something in, um, extra in there um, above and beyond this particular cell population has 27 dots. And this particular cell population has 24 dots. It's, it's a sort of meta-analysis. It gets around this um, one versus two dots inside this population. So we had eight tubes of five colors on 360 subjects. And um, the clinicians tell me that AML is not a difficult thing. You know, I, we try to find this blast population. Uh, I can do that by hand. Great. Um, but again, maybe you don't want to do that by hand 360 times. If we can prove to you that algorithms can do as good a job as you can do by hand, that's kind of a win for us. And it turns out that many of the algorithms perform perfectly. And what does that mean? It says many of the algorithms were able to get perfect sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy versus human on day diagnosing the AML. Again, this may be a simple test, but um, if we can't do this right, um, this is the inverse problem of what I did with Mario Roder's data, because um, we weren't sure how it was going to work out. But if we can't get this one right, we're not going to be able to get other stuff right. But it turns out that many of the algorithms can do it right. Now. Some algorithms got some things wrong, and that's shown along here on the bottom. So this is how many of the algorithms we tested, um, uh, 43 algorithms in total. Uh, how many of those 43 algorithms got a particular patient shown along here on the bottom wrong? There's a misclassification. And um, again, this is one of these things not like the others game. There's this one patient that turned out, like, wow, half the algorithms are getting this patient wrong. Why is that? An obvious question. So uh, we looked at that particular sample. And we found out that um, it kind of looks weird. So uh, this is a typical uh, normal individual, uh, nothing weird going on. Here's a typical person with AML. And the blast frequency in these people, um, I forget what the actual threshold is, but this one happens to be 31%. Um, you see this blast population down here. I think the threshold is about 20 or something like that. But they say, I actually forget what it is with this criteria they use. Point is. Um, it's it, lots of cells in this blast population. This uh, outlier population, the blast frequency isn't really above this threshold that they are that they were comfortable with in terms of making that diagnosis. And it looked a little bit different. It's more, uh, it's not in the same place and not as diff, uh, it's a bit more diffuse than what is really expected. And so when we, show, we showed this clinician and said, you know, not really telling, giving a whole lot of background about what's going on. He said, well, it doesn't really look like AML. Um, maybe some kind of high grade myodysplasia. Maybe there's something diluting the brass frequency. So the neat thing is, we, if we'd given this sample to the best performing algorithm and made a diagnosis, it would have got it right. It would have made it according to what the human had. But by using many different algorithms and, and 
combining them together and seeing where there's misclassification, we found a problem sample. And so um, you can, uh, it pointed to us that there may be something interesting going on in the biology that we might have missed. So we're starting to do discovery. It can be used for doing discovery on the way to diagnosis as well. Uh, here's another example from um, the FlowCap2 study where um, we had uh, gotten a data set where they're doing antigen stimulation post HIV vaccination. Um, gag and end stimulation of these groups. Uh, again, it, it wasn't wasn't a very complicated data set, um, but still the kind of stuff that people um, do to a lot of A color isn't uncommon at all on 48 subjects. And there were six different algorithms that were able to perfectly classify uh, which, it's a bit of a toy example, because it's not the really kind of thing that you usually do to see which kind of stimulation you gave to your samples, because you know which kind of stimulation you gave to these samples. But can the algorithms uncover that uh, based on the data is a, is a valid kind of question, and many of the, uh, in terms of classification problem, anyway, and many of the algorithms were able to do it perfectly. So again, this is more examples on top of what I showed you yesterday that stuff actually works, and I um, mean, go to the paper and find out more about that. So now I'm going to talk to you through two different tools that, are, that weren't involved in the FlowCap study because they came uh, later in just in the last year or so. Um, that can be used for either discovery or uh, they can be used for discovery, another one for diagnosis, archaeoptimics and flow density. I think you'll be using both of those today. Yes, you will. So um, for the archaeoptimics platform, it's a tool for doing discovery. It's, uh, it, needs some, it needs you to feed it the cell populations. And one problem, problem that we have when, bunny ears, that when we looking and doing automated analysis is we're going to find lots and lots of stuff. And we, we've run on this problem several times when doing collaborations is um, we find too much too many things it's too much information so we're going to find three to the m in media phenotypes per post-century assay where m is the number of markers for, for so for um, a two marker study not that anybody does this anymore um, you're going to find nine populations for five marker study you're going to find 243 10 markers gets to be sort of the area where people are kind of working nowadays through the end, the 60,000 different cell populations that are possible in that kind of study. You don't find those by hand. You're not going to go out and gate 60,000 cell populations because you know what you're looking for. But when you're, when you're doing discovery kind of assay, you don't know what you're looking for. And so the computer is going to do something that you can't do, which is find everything. But then when they find everything, you kind of have to mine through that one by one uh, to see which ones are important. And that's going to be coming up on a few slides. So this is the approach that um, we initially used um, to find all these cell populations that seemed to work really well. It's something called FlowType uh, that we published in 2012. And it basically um, separates, sort of like you do now, populations into negative, positive, um, for each of the dimensions that you're looking at. And it's also, um, we don't really care if it's negative or positive because it's not really important to us um, for, for this population. Um, so this don't care state as well. So, this is how it looks in a cartoon. So we basically slice up uh, the negative and positive to try and get the best slice that separates things in different groups. And that seems to work OK, because that's the way you tend to design your experiments. You tend to design them so you have some negative and positive population. Not all the time. And if you're not doing that, like in this case here, um, either because your computation is right or because you have some populations that are more a smear kind of thing, this is not going to work for you. right? This is going to work for you if you have negative and positive populations in the way you find it. And if you have negative populations that are associated with something like a smear, we can probably find that. But if the only thing is a smeary population, not going to work for you. But we think this is going to work for lots of data. Um, the original flow type that's in BioConnector today um, can't handle uh, negative, dim, positive kind of solutions. But um, it's not in BioConnector yet. Um, but the papers, so you're going to walk away today, today here with a whole bunch of tools, but um, it's going to be out of date by next week because this is a moving field. It's really rapidly progressing. And so you have to keep up with the literature. You have to keep checking BioConnector now and then. Um, you want to see if the packages have been updated, um, that there's a new version of, for example, flow type being going to be released. But, um, if you don't check these things, you're not going to be know. It's like any active... Field. You want to read the latest stuff that's going on. And now you have a whole new bunch of papers to put into your PubMed searches. I, I want to get all the flow cytometry bioinformatics tools because it's a really active area of development. Stuff is changing. And here's one example. So the stuff that is in BioConnector today was using the old type of flow type. Used a brute force. I'm not, no math today, but um, used a brute force. It's called a brute force approach. 
We now have a dynamic uh, programming approach. Works much better. And here's one example of why it sucks to be on a laptop. Um, this is the old, this is how the runtime in seconds for the old version of Flowtype. Um, old as in the one that you get today. Um, the one that we should be having in Flowtype in the next couple of weeks, much quicker um, in terms of number of cells, how long it's going to take you to uh, run that. Um, also for number of markers. If you're doing more than 10 markers, it gets to be really, really, really slow. The old type now scales perfectly. And the other thing we can do now with the new version of Flowtype is we can handle more than uh, positive and negative. Um, we can slice it and do as many bins as we think there actually are. So that's a win. But the main point of this is you're going to have to keep up in the literature now. The bad news is what I said is we're going to find lots of different stuff. And so this is my Star Wars slide because it's just too much to fit on the page. I actually had to you know, tilt it down to get the whole list of 101 phenotypes um, that we find. Because we're going we're gonna to find everything. And everything is probably going to be a lot. And this is only showing the significant immune phenotypes. You see here the p-values is still 10... This is still 10 to the minus 7. This is, you know, a re this potentially is a really, really important phenotype. And the problem we had is um, which one, it's like doing microarrays all over again, right? We're going to find lots of stuff. Which one of these is the one that you want to follow up on? Because there's just too many. You're not going to follow all 101. And you can see, well, there's a lot of here, there's a lot here with a KI67, but then here's a whole bunch. No, you can't see it. I can't because I'm standing right next to it. Um, there's a whole this case, you 7 positive, and there's some that are CD8, and some that are CD45, and CD28. But here's the CD45 over here, and here's the 35 over there. It was really hard. It was really hard to figure it out. And so it's not Star Wars in the sense of happy Ewoks dancing around. It, it, this, is, um, this is dads cutting off their son's arm. I mean, this is the unhappy Star Wars. We're not really solving anybody's problem. And uh, so this is a collaboration that was done with Mario Roder. We showed him this big list. It's like, here it is. It's in here somewhere. He's like, this is not helping me. This is not solving my problem. Now I just got something else I have to look at. Is um, you alluded to the problem like microarrays? Is there also a problem of false discovery? Right? <laughs> yeah, so we can account for that. So we, we do so we do multiple testing. So, so those are all actual real discoveries. Yeah. yeah. One hundred and one. You've already discarded the false discoveries. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So so what do you do? So we solve the problem because then we get another paper out of it. Uh, and because we make Mario happy, and that's really important. Um, so we have this whole long list. And the, the, the thing we realized, which is obvious in retrospect, I guess, is that these are all highly related. So um, here's this KSC7, CD4 negative, CCR5, CD127 negative population, really significant. Um, you can get to that population in many different ways. And get to that in the sense of gating. So starting from all T cells, you can either start with K, you know, gate on the K67 or the CD4, or the CCR5, or the C217. Once you have that population, then you can add in the next marker. And so you, this is a gating hierarchy until trying to delve down until you get to the population of interest. And we basically we can build these hierarchies for each of these populations. We can also color each of these nodes with the p-value. So this is all, everything, remember yesterday when I said everything, almost anything is, that we do is associated with statistics? All these p-value, all these populations are significantly associated with their ability to distinguish between people who are going to die of HIV tomorrow and people who are going to be kind of okay. And that's, that was the question that he wanted to have answered. So here's this, KI, here, here's this population that, he, that we found that's very significantly associated, associated with the ability to distinguish between the two. But... When, you, when we laid it out in this way for this one particular population, we see higher up in the hierarchy, there's a population that requires fewer markers, and because it requires fewer markers, there's also a bigger population. It's a larger proportion. Um, so this, 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 is kind of, oh, this is kind of interesting. Um, the thickness of these arrows is how much the p-value is changing when you've gone from a population to adding it to the next one. That population is in, uh Decreased a lot when you go to here. Decreased p value, increased p value. Gotten better. Um, so there's different ways you can trace down to that uh, population of interest. And there's a mathematical way you can figure out um, what's the best way. So if we're trying to get to here, um, the best way we can go is where the p values get high very quickly. And so if we trace down this way, this is the best. Getting, this is the best gating hierarchy to get to this population. Out of all those 101, that's the one path for that. For that one immunophenotype out of the 101, that's the best path to get to that. 
But we have 101 different immunophenid types. So for each of those immunophenid types, we drew the tree. And for each of those trees, we get the best path. So now we have 101 gating hierarchy paths. Still not helping until we get to this part. And we took all those 101 paths and merged them together. So this figure is the real money shot because it combines everything in the data. So this is sort of like the spade view of the data. It says, I've looked at everything in your data. I've looked at all the significant immunophenotypes types that tell me the ability between uh, diagnosing or making the distinguish between group one and group two. Here's all the important ones. I've combined them together, and um, out of all these, um, uh, here it is. This is your data. It's all 466 samples. You don't have to look at dots anymore. You don't want to look at um, gating. This is sort of a meta-analysis, meta-overview. And so the interesting thing is, well, here's some stuff that pops out. It's, it's kind of easy for Mario to understand. I want to look for stuff that's up here. There it is. Without, you don't have to look at any gates at this point. The computer just said, here's the most important immunophenid type. Now, if you want to, you can go look at KC7 positive, CCR5 positive, and see by hand, does it actually look right? Has a computer messed up? But it gives you somewhere to look. Remember, we're doing discovery, trying to find stuff that in, is interesting. And there's a couple other ones here that are interesting as well. Um, something we found a few times is um, this, the significant p-values kind of peter out after about one, two, three, four, five or so markers. Adding more doesn't really help you. Um, doesn't help you in a couple ways. Is these are much more rare populations. They're using more markers. There's fewer tend to be fewer cells in there, um, so they're harder to gate. And the p-values don't tend to be as high as the ones up here. Um, so the call corollary of this, if that's the right word, um, you can do something like a. It's a really good um, example of where Cytop becomes useful. Is you do a big fishing expedition, throw in as many markers as you can possibly afford, because you don't know what's going to turn up. Then you find the one population or two populations that are really interesting that use a few markers. Now, you don't have to do Cytop anymore. You've done that whole fishing expedition. We say this is the population that's really interesting to you. Uh, but it also works if you're doing 16 color or any kind of high dimensional analysis. You want to, when you're doing discovery, you don't know what to look for. Use as many markers as you can. Just mine the whole space. And Archaeoptimics will tell you what's the most important one. Um, so, in summary, Archaeoptimics is a really good way, I think. Um, and I think because we've used this on many different data sets, um, some that are impressed, some that are still working out, um, to look for lots of different cell populations. You can use any kind of way that you want to use to find those cell populations. If you want to do manual gating on those 466 samples and get all those cell populations, you can use, do that. That's fine. Then you split that into Archaeoptimics, and it will tell you what's the most important one. You can use Spade if you want. Use Spade to find all these cell populations. You just need some way to find cell populations. We use flow type. It seemed to work. It doesn't really matter. Once you have all the cell populations identified, you throw it into this, and they'll draw this nice figure for you saying, oh, it's that one. Um, but uh, a lot of people use Spade, and um, one of the questions that I've been asked is, how does this work versus Spade? So there's a couple different things. Um, this is, uh, we'll get the same answer the second time with Archaeoptimics. We'll get you p-values, um, which you don't really get, not really done in the same way is, well, that's probably the best way I can say it, um, versus spade. Um, but we both give you this nice overview of the whole um, data, which is really useful when you're doing high dimensional or, or really complicated experiments. Um, so they both work on CITOF. How we define the distance between populations and how we find these things and the relationships is a bit better. And this is one of the things with all these algorithms, like I showed you before, we're all approaching the, the, the challenge a bit different way in terms of statistics. Um, we don't have to do this manual annotation that's sort of associated with CITOP, where you have to pull these blebs out and draw boxes around things. Um, theirs does work really good for gradual expression change. Ours doesn't. Um, we can find some of our markers involved. But more or less, we're kind of the same in terms of how good we are. Um, so this paper came out, uh, the Archon paper came out last year. Right. Yeah? You mentioned that you can use Spade to populate the Archon. Yes. So I'm, I'm kind of confused as to why, how you how you're comparing them. Um, so this 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 is um, uh, not using if, if we pop, this is um, using flow type with Archaeoptimics. Okay. And this is using the spade by itself. So this is the flow type Archaeoptimics platform. Uh, could you 
break down those descriptions on the side again? Are relationships defined by distance? Um, so when in spade, these spade trees, I'm not, um, it's described a lot in their paper. Um, the mathematics behind that is the way they do their, their sampling and how they draw these um, bloods. It's how far apart these pop these they're not essentially they're not really cell populations. Um, it's a bit abstracted from that, and the way these. Um, bloods are drawn is how far apart these clusters of dots are in high dimensional space. Um, and it's based on uh, a distance kind of measure. Um, we're not, we're splitting populations. Um, I, we, I didn't want to do the math because on um, spade, but we, we can do that if you want. Um, the way we do it, the way we do it in, so the, the measures here is how, how far apart, what they're showing you is how far apart these populations are, allows them to group these things together. And here, this p value is based on um, how the ability of the population to distinguish between the labels that you've assigned to the samples. So you put these in group one, these in group two. This population has a very strong ability to predict which group you belong to. So if it's above, we, we make some, we do. Um, the Archimarx platform uh, does thresholds and it picks the best threshold. So if you have some population that's up, um, the proportions here and the other proportions down here, the Archimarx platform says, okay, I want to draw a line here. And every, any cell, in the future, any sample that comes through that's above that threshold is going to be in that group. Any, populate, any sample that's below that threshold in your proportion is going to be in the other group. And if that's how the p-values gets, and then we test that on some other samples and that's how we figure out um, how to draw the threshold and what the predictive value is. And if you have something here, it becomes much, if you have two populations in terms of proportion that are overlapping like this, it becomes much harder to draw a line between those two proportions to get something that's going to be able to give you a really good predictive value. So the flip side of that, so I think that works. Um, I'm pretty much willing to guarantee that's going to work on your data if you're doing that kind of thing. If it doesn't, let us know. And that goes for everything. Um, if, stuff, if stuff doesn't work, let the people know because that's how things improve. Um, I'm even more excited about flow density um, because people want to want to do that more. So okay, um, we can do that. Um, it's a package that really leverages the complete flow, uh, flow informatics infrastructure that's in our bike connector. So it uses everything. Again, we didn't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. It's easy to use. It's flexible. It just takes a few seconds to get an FCS file. It's based on density estimation techniques. So we're looking at um, uh, how these densities change in different kinds of samples. And what we what the, the goal of this tool is to automate the practice of 2D gating. So you have to start with a gating strategy. This is how it kind of works without showing the math behind that. Um, if there's three more populations, for example, this B cell population down here, um, we look for all the peaks, and then we look at where those peaks are uh, in, re in relationship to each other. We look at the height of the peaks and its distance from the peak next to it. We find the biggest peak, and then we make a cut. And we say, okay, this is, this is where we want to draw the line. And um, this is where it takes, the first time you do this, you have to make up these rules based on your gating hierarchy. So you have to know where the populations are. And you have to, we give you some different choices about how um, that, you, that you might, we give you the ability to make different choices about the best way, which approach to use, that's the words I'm looking for, on how to draw that line. And you basically uh, make these check boxes. I want to do it this way, this way, this way, this way. So it's, you're giving some options to your um, uh, function in R. Um, if there's one peak, this is the kind of a tricky one. Um, and because there's a couple different, because there's no, if there's only one peak, there's, there's going to be very little information usually in the data that says this is where the line has to be drawn. So um, in this case, well, um, because we know how the data is going to look, we know that um, well, what, what can happen a lot is you get this shoulder. And this happens, um, at least for this case and many other cases, where the density kind of changes its direction. And so we can look mathematically, and we won't go into how that actually works, but um, you can look for a change of slope um, is one way we do that, um, to find that inflection point for where that slope changes, and then we draw the cut at that point. Um, if that doesn't work, you can do other things like... Um, we want everything over the 80 to 5th percentile because that just works for our data. So you have to know how your data is going to look. 
Um, but we have we make some we can make some really good guesses based on all the data sets that we've looked at about um, intelligent choices to make. Um, this, it doesn't doesn't take that hard. It's usually a few days to take a gating hierarchy and implement that in flow density. But once that those couple of days, few days are done, you don't have to adjust your gates anymore because the algorithm does that based on each new data set that comes along. Um, here's another example. Um, if all the other choices, so we, if you don't know what your data looks like, we, we make some guesses. If you do, we can help train that. Um, if, it, if nothing else fails, we just can pick some um, standard deviations, plus or minus, and that works sometimes for some data sets. Again, you have, you have to go walk through this to see what, what the best option that's going to work. If there's two populations, it's really easy. One, two peaks, you just cut in the middle between the two. So how do you use that? Uh, you, need, you need to have a strategy. Because we're doing diagnosis, you know what you're looking for. So you have to have something done it, worked up in Flojo. Um, you need some 2D gates, step-by-step, um, step, some expression levels, plus or minus. Um, we can find stuff that's highly expressed versus dim. It just needs a bit more options to be set. This is how it works. So we had a flow cap 3 last November. Um, we had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 different groups participate. Um, this is showing how those groups uh, compared against the data set uh, that was analyzed uh, versus manual gating. So we had um, nine different centers on, uh, with expert gating centralized on that data set. And so the variation of the humans of the human across centers, this is accounting this is taking into account center effects and as many effects that we could take. So that was all removed and what's left is the variation of manual gating. And we know there's going to be some variation in that. Where there is red, that means the automated method has been farther away from manual gating than we would have liked. It's statistically different. So we can't find everything necessarily all the time, but we seem to be doing pretty good than most of the other methods. This is the method OpenSIDO from Rapid Agricultural's group. We're working together um, to improve both our methods because we're using, because uh, they're complementary. Uh, this is on the B cell panel. Um, we're not going to be any different. We were not any different than what the humans had done on the B cell panel. It seems to be working pretty good. Uh, Dense 2 actually worked here, but it didn't work very good on the T cell panel. On the other ones, yeah, not so much. So in summary, um, really excited about this tool because it um, it seems to work. Uh, we've used we've used this one on three or four different data sets, and it's been really phenomenal how well it's worked. And it's really great for me to be able to get up here and say, stuff is finally working after all these years. We spent writing what you learned all about yesterday, all these tools to get stuff, doing all the quality checking and stuff. This is where it's getting more exciting, because we're getting what people want, which is not have to do the manual gating. It's going to be within the average of expert humans, which is as good as they can get in terms of doing diagnosis. We can't do any better than that. Um, I'm pretty much guaranteeing you're going to get the same results you're going to get by hand. Uh, if you don't, I will give you your money back. Um, it's all in bio, except it's not in bioconductors today, but it's in your virtual machines. It'll be in there soon. Um, what we're going to do next is get stuff into open Cyto and gene pattern, and I think I'm talking about that uh, in module six. So again, this is just a large collaborative effort. Um, the flow cap has been going on for a long time. Um, Nima, who's my graduate student, is now in Gary Nolan's lab. Greg Pinnock and Raphael Ricciardo at the Fred Hutch. Um, the other two PIs are Tim Austin and Richard Sherman. Uh, everybody who provided data could not have done that without them. Flowside.org. Um, here's the uh, NEMA. Adrian uh, worked on uh, archaeopteryx, and uh, along with Kieran on flow type two and Jafar and Rush Medina all helped out on flow density. Um, the analysis of the flow density package was done through HIPC um, with the uh, consortium Holden Maker Phil McCoy involved in that. And with that, it's time for more coding. Any questions? Yeah, you've got two slides. Third or what side from the back? Oh, from the back. Can you elaborate on what slides mean? It's how how different. Um, what we're trying to see is what the purpose of this figure is to show how different we are than manual gating. So what, um, red means we're significantly different than what they've gotten by hand. There's some very there's some variation, which is shown by here, on um, based on how how much of the 
how much manual gating is changing across different samples. And we're trying to see how much different, on top of that variation, how much variation is there due to manual versus automated. And what we're trying, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get rid of the effects that are due to things that aren't gating. So if you look at how the results on two samples, um, when you have data from different centers, what can happen is you can have an effect that is due to that data has come from a different center. So it's like a batch effect. But what we were trying to do is count, account for all these different batch effects that we knew would be there. And one of the, one, one of the obvious ones was uh, coming from different centers. Um, the other one was other instrumentation. So even if they're coming from the same center, they may be running on different instruments. And so that is an effect. And so we removed those effects that we knew uh, that we knew could be a problem. That we, if you analyze them, you can see, oh, there's an effect due to um, centers. And if you look at, if you, if you do some uh, views of the data, you can see that uh, here's the data from the same center. But then if you look at the proportions um, that are in uh, a specific cell population, the proportions that are coming off one instrument is different than the proportions that are coming off another instrument. So that's another effect. So we can account for that. So that, that would be why you have a bar of Yeah. And then on top of that is, well, now we count for all those effects. Now we're looking at, okay, now we've gated that data by hand. Now we've gated that same data on the computer. What extra effects are there due to that kind of gating? And what we, what we don't want to have to do is you, you, go, you want to take away all those effects that you know about, and then hopefully when you look at manual versus automated, there is no difference left over. But you have to account for all that because first off, and then after you count for all those effects that you know about, then we look to see what's left over. And that's how we get those red lines. Um, <coughs> that's fine. I'm looking at the figures for so density algorithm. We've got four slides. The flow density algorithm with three more populations versus the figure of the flow density algorithm with one population. And to my eyes, it looks like in either figure we have three blocks. Ah, uh, right. It's a bit, it depends which pot, which. So again, this is uh, one of the big questions we have is what defines a population, right? So how do you say this is one population versus two? Um, oh, it also depends which dimension you're looking at. So here, um, this is we're trying to find in this dimension. Um, is that right? This one, there's only it depends which way you're looking at. Is there one or three? How you want to do that cut? So in some, in some ways, so in here, looking down this way, there's not three. Here, we'd say there's three because you're seeing that curve. And so you have to use both of those when you're doing flow density to figure out on one axis versus the other axis um, how you want to make that cut. Okay. And so that then, so all right. So you're using like like the one saying the third flow density algorithm output using um, the cutoff value. So let's look at the figure next to that where it looks like there's only two blocks and where it has, okay. Now there's somebody using an inflection point yeah. to see where that little... Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure this one, I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive this one's an inflection point here that we're trying to... Okay. And again, um, this is where it takes two days for a getting hierarchy. You, you'll try... So again, if there, for this example where there's one population, there, there's kind of three, four, one, two, three, four, five different ways. This, this is the hard problem where there's, where's, when there's data like this. And this is why automated gating, in a general sense, does not work when you try and do diagnosis. You can't take something like flow means, or same spectral, or flow cluster, or spade, or a general, one of these off, uh, an unsupervised algorithm to do diagnosis because an unsupervised algorithm is going to use the same approach for every single cell population. And that doesn't work when you're doing diagnosis because of these rare populations, essentially rare populations are what gets you. And for these rare populations, you have to try on your own data five, up, at most five different ways to get that threshold right. Um, and so first, um, or three different ways, I guess. Yeah, three different ways, I think. So um, 
you try you can try the tracking slope, you can try a percentile, you can try a standard deviation from the mean. And one of those is probably going to work because that's what you that's in your head what you what you're doing right now. And you have, you have to basically make these rules up. You have to take the rules that are in your head. I think we were talking about this yesterday. These rules that you have in your head, and you have to encode them into R. And the rules that seem to work are, well, I'm, I'm looking for a bump. And you, you see that by your eye, but now you can tell the computer, look for a bump. Or you have in your head that maybe it's the 95th percentile. Um, or you have an FML control. Ah, that's the first time that's, I've been waiting for that point to come up. And, and, sorry, so and by God, I wish people I, I wish people ran FMO controls. So that's so so but if you go back to the if you go back to the one with the, the three populations, no, 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 that one. That's that my 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 pierce resistance data set looks like that. That's that's the pop, that's the that's the pattern that I'm seeing that yeah. defines something really, really important. But I don't get that that, that dim population, the twenty C in your case twenty two. I don't think it's a dim population unless I have anything in my control. So I've been doing I've been doing data analysis of full structure data for since two thousand and five. Do you know how many data sets we've gotten with FML controls? Hey, bullshit. Oh, you you got mine. Why? 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 Oh, just ignore the emails because they were one last year. No, you've got mine. Yeah. Yeah. Why? 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 We don't really apply because our flyout rates are dead. So, 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 so this goes back to the whole, I guess we're talking about just garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And the more stuff that you can give, it's going to help. But people don't run FMO controls? I, I, I never, I, because I'm using so many different patients' yeah. Because it takes a lot more. Time and money. So, so, them before to kind of have an idea of where, you know, where the positive and negative might be, but it's never done in the same sample spinning tube. I will go and do a sort, a sort, um, and I'll take down uh, seven or eight tubes. One of them is a sample, and the others are more with FMO control. But having said that, we always do that for any policy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the yeah. The, the the surface, these are the sur surface markers. markers. Yeah. For the surface yeah. markers, most of the time the, the distance is such that it's not a problem. But I mean, yeah. yeah. Again, if Mario was if Mario was in the room, he'd be beating you, right? So. <laughs> no, it's not it's not feasible. Yeah. I mean, I can't yeah. justify. Yeah. It's not like no. an agent. It, so what? So I've asked this of clinicians, and they tell me something I can't express right now. And they say, "Well, you know, you have internal controls." In each of these samples, you have population, so like in, in the purposes of looking at maturity the birth of this infant, you have populations that should not, in their healthy state, express a particular marker. Based on discovery that we've done in the past, oh, and, yeah, and yeah, the yeah. assumptions that we've made. And right, yeah, so yeah. I'm thinking of um, ZAP70 expression, where your aberrant B cells will express ZAP70, and that is a in a significant state, if the expression of B cells with ZAP70 is distinctly greater than the expression of ZAP70 in T cells, which would be an internal negative control. That, that, that's the clearest description I can have here. Um, and I'm not going to say that I know everything about the, you know, the, 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 the biological underpinnings of this thing, but I've asked that question to a large group of, of doctors, and I said, how do you how do you set cutoffs without FMOs? And they say, well, we have internal positive controls and internal negative controls in that same one there is one to the same. Um, so that, maybe they're that, that having, that. having yeah. settled that, I can I, I have another I have another sort of group of samples, which I call quick views, where I have an unstated sample and a full state sample, no, no right. yeah. But because yeah. I know what the populations are, because of because it's no longer discovery, it's really just it's really sort of, it's more like a diagnostic approach. Yeah. Just, I'm just checking to see what populations are in the sample that's currently. I can get away with it. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah, this is not discovery on my side. This is, yeah. this is purely a diagnostic. Um, so, they, so there's the expectation um, that some stuff should be there. And when it's not, that's the real condition for the other populations expression in the same, in the same group. 
and so, so I don't. So I asked this, and folks say, "Gee, well, there are no control suites." But how do you assess that? I mean, if you work here enough, you won't go away. So you find seven there. What you probably see is that they would just the regular would be where your lower gate is. It would still not distinguish that high and medium. So, um, we. It would help you set that. Maybe. Then, so we, I would, if you have some ethanol data, I would love to have it today. Yeah. Because um, we, we don't have that in full density package right now, and before we publish, I mean, it'd be really simple for us to add in one extra step that here's my FMO can sample. Thank you. Well, we have on stage, but this is it. No, it's not the same. Come on down. I've got this. Yeah, I've got that. All right. All I need is like one sample, just one example for the paper. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so I gave this talk at Saito a couple last month, and somebody's what, what about FMO controls? It's like we didn't have FMO controls. We didn't have that for the use case that we used to develop full density. So the full density package is based was written to solve the problem um, of the HIPC data set, which I think I talked about yesterday. Where there's they had the panel, they knew what they're going to find the T cells, the B cells, the different centers, nine uh, a color assay, and they didn't they didn't have FMO controls because it's too much money. They're not going to run them. Um, if we have them, it makes total sense, right? You can set a threshold based on that. But um, I just need an example so we can code it up and put it in the paper and, and publish this. That would be nice. It's really ready. Cool. I'm glad I came here. <laughs> so mine. Uh, any other questions? No, that's what that's what I wanted. Is I wanted a KMO tool as part of this as part of this tool, so that you can then you know bang it in and say it. You know, it will take a couple days to a couple days to add it in. And then, then one of the options that we would have in the package is that you would point to your fundamental control and say, for this for this particular population, here's my fundamental control. And then the computer would look at it, set the threshold, and then above that. And then you have to say what your threshold is that you want above that. Is it positive? Really simple to do. Everyone's happy. I think it depends on the design of these experiments as well. I mean, a lot of times, might be looking for an FMO control for a marker, but it's that marker that you're actually analyzing. Like in the case, like we do phosphor stuff, and we're running three phosphor markers at the same time. It's like a universe FM3 control, right? You have three different. But I mean, you're, we'll see multimodality in the data and the, the phosphor data. So I mean, someone would ask, well, where's your FMO control? Because you want to look at within those, those say those multiple populations and you shifts, right? But it wasn't an experimental design, so because we're we're actually Mining that data in the first place. Yeah. Right. Which are so right. For differential expression yeah. on those. Yeah. Data mining versus so it's again diagnosis for discovery and how you set up those panels and the approaches that you use and um, yeah you have to yeah. good so hopefully Redina's voice is back and she's feeling better. You're 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 fading you're fading yesterday. <laughs> well, I'm just going to do a uh, question about, can you make sure I understand this better, that the figures are talking about the cellular hierarchy concepts? Yeah. So you have the thickness of the gray arrows between the different um, populations, and then you have the color plane describing the, the p values. Well, there's a thickness, yeah, there's a color body. Okay, so just on the side, let's confirm that the red color indicates a high significance. Yeah, so then. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So. All right, so let's look at um, the, the, yeah, the third, let's look at that transition from the blue population above it, which is that? CCR5. CCR5. And, and then, then we add K67, and the pop, and the significance and the ability to distinguish between the two states has increased a lot. Okay, and that's the thickness of the arrow. Yeah. Okay. And so this, the, we use we, we use the these thicknesses to find the best, during the, during the way of finding the best path. We want to look for big changes early. To find to get all those best paths through okay. the data set, but but this this and this is also for a bang for the buck. Um, so if you if you're somewhere here on a, like a four color, well I can add one more color and it's really going to help me a lot. But that's also shown by um, the color itself. So this requires two distinct groups, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, so just two. Uh, Right, we're doing we're doing discovery. Yeah. 
in order to do discovery, you have your, your hypothesis is that there's there I have a bunch of samples in group one, a bunch of samples in group. Or, so what's the end in each one? Ah, uh, <laughs> you know how many? If I would be a rich man if I had a dollar for every time, every time a question, all the time. How many? Yeah. So it. I mean, what's the power? Of it depends. Yeah. It it it, so, and it's really hard um, to f do a power calculation for flow. Um, we, we've done it because we had to do it for a grant. People expect that. It's a lot of hand waving. Um, you can say if, if, and the way we did it is if the population that's going to distinguish between Group one and group two looks, and it looks like this example population, where it's portion one, proportion two, um, and the portions are this different. We would need this many samples. Um, so depend, and but that kind of gets around the problem uh, that evo skirts around the issue of how easy it is to automatically distinguish between population and population two. That's a separate problem, right? So one is the build, um, how different the proportions are and how easy is it to find those differences in proportions. And you have to do both, right? Um, if it's a rare population that's close to a big population, that's going to be probably hard to find in discovery. And so um, you may never find that automated. You may, with something like this, the win is that um, if, if it's something like this and it's a rare population, we, we kind of hope that that rare population has something closely associated to that, that something like this is at least going to point you in the right area. Um, we may not get the, in that case, we may not get the exact population correctly, but will get you close, then you go to manual gating, and you actually see, oh, this is another population that's right there, and that was grouped together, but it's still distinguishing that. And we've found that before. It, you, you go back, you can go back and look at this by hand. You're not going to just trust this. And so um, we may not get you the right population, but we'll get you close in high dimensional space. Um, also depends on how big that proportion has changed um, between uh, group one and group two. So if it's if all your sick people are going to die because it's 20% of the cells have this, and then everybody else is 21, and if everybody has that, it's you can find if you have enough patients, you will find you can get a p-value out of that. That's going to be significant. If you if you find if you look at a thousand patients, everybody in group one has less than 20. Everyone in group two has 21 to 23 you get a very high p value of that. One of the problems that we've had is that even if we tell you the p is 10 to the minus 10 and you know it's 20 versus 21, nobody's going to use that because it's not going to be enough for them even though it's statistically significant. And it's like and then we're get, then we're stuck. It's like well this you want a statistical result, this is the statistical result and they say well I'm not willing to follow that because it's still I'm not comfortable with that. Um, answer your question, 30. I, 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 but per group. Right, but, but, 
But more, more is always better. Yeah, 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 sure. But, but real, realistically, <laughs> realistically, re realistically, thirty per group. Yeah. If there's something that's really significant, it'll probably show, you're not going to find. You're going to lose some stuff. If there's something in there, that'll be enough to find that. If there's something that's big enough difference. Thirty is a very good start. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> if I, if I, they want, they want a number. I give them a number. Thir I understand that it varies a lot. But it, it varies a lot. Idea, but what's not really going to, I can tell you what's not going to work is three. No, that, that's fine. I have worked with three microarrays, three patients, microarrays. That's a common experience. It's very yeah. intense. But that doesn't, it doesn't work for, that doesn't work for flow. No. Three will not work for flow. We, we've tried it and on some of the examples. Right? Yeah. But it, 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 if that's all you have, then it's really up to the biologist to come up with a, what 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 you what you can't do is come with me through three samples and I tell you this one's different and it's twenty versus twenty one percent. Then, then you can't you can't argue with me at that point, right? So, but even with um, even if you have thousands of samples, you still have that problem of twenty versus twenty one. At the end of the day, because that's that's something I'm faced a lot with uh, presenting the, the the data that um, I got working with Lima was somebody would ask, me, okay, if the difference of percentage of any cell subset is point zero five compared to point zero six, and it is constantly higher in HIV than for the healthy, but at the end of the day, what that means is what? That, that, that's what gets you into the cell paper, right? So that's the difference between finding something and then doing the mouse models and actually showing that that's what, why, why is it? That's tough. We can't help you with that. We can't help you with that. <laughs> and the, the other problem is, the other, and I don't think I talked about that yet, is we find some stuff, I, I don't, I'm just pointing at something randomly, we're going to find something like with eight markers. I'll, 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 actually, I won't tell you about that now because that's this afternoon's talk. Sorry. Are we good? Yeah. All right. So now you get to learn how to use these awesome tools, or at least a couple of them. But there may be an announcement, or there may be a break. Are we just gonna, are we hopping right in? Twenty minutes. All right. So we can hop right in. We can do a bit of coding to get warmed up. You can, of course, you can ask one question. You mentioned the, the biggest problem with, with your platform is, is greater cell population. And I'm wondering how, like, how you deal with gradients, because it seems like the, the, what you call the rare cell population, and one of those, it could actually be considered a gradient, where there's, um, you know, cells are differentially expressing, or, you know, the plant's body is differentially binding in, in very small intervals across the distance, right? So, so the question is, um, rare population? Rare populations seem to be a problem, and how do we deal with them? No, no, an actual gradient. Of, a, a gradient. Uh, cellular expression. So, you know, low to high, it's not really, you can't really get a population there. If you were looking at a histogram, it would be like a, a slope. So, it's actually right. just antibody binding at different differential, different degrees across the. the right. Stream. So, how, how do we deal with that when we're doing diagnosis, or how do we try and do, deal with that when we're doing discovery? I don't, I don't So, when, if, it's, if we're trying to do. Um, Di if you're trying to do diagnosis, um, we have to look at those samples. So here's an example of something maybe that kind of looks like that, right? There's a, there's a population here. How do you deal with that in automated gating? That's what, that's what so this is auto so in this case of automated gating, what we do is we look at some samples, and you say, I want to find this, and we'll try three different approaches that's going to work. So we have some tests set. You say, here's, here's, here's my data. Here's the population I want to find. Um, here's how I think I would find that. And we look at that and say, okay, you want this, and we look at the density distribution here, and we see that there's a bit of a shoulder based on here's a big thing, here's a little thing. 
Um, and that shoulder is in that test set that you gave us. And so we'll say, oh, well, we, we can just use the track slope method here to find where that is. And then the assumption is, OK, then you give us a test set, uh, or a training set. In the training set, sorry, we find this. In the test set, we see if that actually works. If it works in the test set, we're done. And then our hope is, from now until the end of time, everything else is going to look like this. But I guess my point is that I don't feel that that's a population or should be gated at all. Then, if, if you don't, if you don't have to get it, so so this is this is where you have the gating hierarchy, right? If, if you don't care about this and you're using flow density, you do care, but it's not a population. I think it's important that there's a gradient there, that there's a that there is a say compared to the FMO underneath the gate, that there, you know, okay. something's happening, right? Okay. But it's not necessarily a population; it's just an increase in expression. I think I'm just arguing about the definition of population. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, we, yeah I, I, I alluded to that, right, with, with Suzanne's question, is what, what, is a, what is a cell population? Um, uh, that's a very, so I, I'm talking this afternoon about ontologies and trying to define what these things are. Um, the question, how, I, can, I can put it this way, is there a bunch of dots that you want to find, and would you put those dots into a different box than these other dots? If you think those dots belong, should be counted separately from these other dots that should be counted separately, how would you decide those dots go in group one versus those dots go in group two? And if you, if this looking at the change of slope works for you, then and if that change of slope is going to be in the training set and it's in the test set, then that's good enough for me. And hopefully things don't change from now on. Um, if you decide that you want to find those dots in a different, you want to put those dots into a different group, um, then we have to find a better way to get those dots into a different group. Uh, but this, see, we have a couple, we have three different choices that seem to work. This looking for the slope, picking some arbitrary percentile, looking for plus or minus standard deviation are the three things that have worked on every data set that we've looked at. Well, if you're doing discovery, much more difficult problem. None of the automated tools that I am aware of are robust in the ability to detect rare populations consistently in a way that I would get up here and say, use this tool, it's going to work. It's a, it's a difficult problem. I, I have heard that Spade is, gives you a different answer every time you start. It's that's, that's, a that's a different, is that a different problem. That's a different problem. Um, it's not, that's not related to rare cells. It's the way, related to the way they do their sampling. Um, um, this is why, um, if you're trying to find a rare, if you're trying to, if you're trying to find a rare population, that to me means you're doing diagnosis, and that to me means you need to do supervised discovery, which means you need a tool like flow density. If you need to find something, that means you're doing discovery. You don't care if it's a rare cell population or not. And what we've tended to find, if you're trying to do discovery is um, you'll find something. Like you, 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 unless it's Parkinson's disease, <laughs> where we did. <laughs> um, but, gen but generally, um, you don't care what it is. And if it's, only the, if it's only the, if there's only one population in there, and it's a rare population, you're, you're probably um, hooped. <laughs> um, if that's the only thing that's going to be in your discovery and you don't know what it's, what it's going to be, you're probably not going to find that. You're not going to find that by hand and you're not going to find that with an automated method. If it's one rare population in 60,000, unless you have some kind of hypothesis that that's the one. And if you have a hypothesis that it could be something in here, and you can do something like do a diagnostic kind of approach as well as doing a um, discovery approach. And there's nothing wrong with that. You could say, well, I have this hypothesis in my head that it could be it's sort of a T or B cell related, and you know what most of the common immunophenotypes there are, and you can do that on your discovery data set to find those common things and then on, as well on top of that run something completely unsupervised. That works. We haven't done that yet but that's a, a completely viable kind of approach. Theoretically, if you had more theoretical markers to, to this data set, you could that, better resolve. That, that might pull out oh, in some higher dimension. We actually talked to them about that. Yes. that they need to improve their, some of their gates look a little bit. So what we are doing here is replicating manual gates. So so Someone has decided this is the right way to gate this. It wasn't me. I'm not taking their word for it. 
um, and I'm just trying to copy exactly what they have done the best I can to match it. And we have made some comments to them about some of their gating seems a little bit random where they place the gate. doesn't seem to be any particularly specific logic to it. And they said, oh yeah, I know you're right. Maybe yeah. we should look at another population and try to help us you know, more reliably set the gate. So hopefully that, that will happen in a day now. Is there a way to get a measure of modality like within like any particular so we have three modes here with this, this yeah. uh, level of significance, or two modes, and in this case, you say C27. Uh, is there an algorithm that can look at that and yeah. so, we, yeah. to determine? And, and maybe if you compare it to other distributions in the data. So we, we, do this, we, we, we do this in flow density. That's the first thing we do is we, we, we look for peaks. And then so, so what is a peak is the same thing as what is a cell population, right? So you can find little stuff out in space. So what we do is it has to be big. It has to be far from something else. That's how we define these modes. And then we count how many of these. We have some heuristic that says if it's big enough and far enough away from something else, then it's a mode. It's a cell population. And so that's how we figure out is there one, two, or three. Does it do it relatively, like comparatively within, within the data set? Uh, no, it does it per, per pair of markers, per marker. So the more, but if you know stuff about your data, um, maybe we'll go today, but we do right now. We do this all the pairwise combinations. Actually, one marker. At a time. One, one marker at a time. We're plotting it pairwise, but 